Greetings everyone and welcome back to my channel, The Grim Reader. I am Kathy Grimm, The Grim Reader, always trying to make sure that you see the t-shirt that I put on for the video. Because <laughs> uh, when, when I'm not filming, I just wear my plain t-shirts. I have, my whole wardrobe is predicated on plain and print, and the print ones are re really for going out in public. Um, the plain ones are for just at home. I don't know why I told you that, but I did. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm here to give you a little bit more insight into the long novel that I'm listening to. And it's one of these overwhelming topics. Uh, Jessica had asked for more insight into what I like about this novel. I'm mainly listening to, but also reading along with, and it is uh, Alan Moore's Jerusalem. And it comes, I have a cassette of the three different volumes, but it is one big long book. It's about 1200 pages long and it's fantastic. I am really enjoying it and I didn't know what I was going to what I was be, what I was getting into and I think part of the enjoyment is this is way better than I I thought. I thought it might get a little bit tedious or boring or hard to get into and I would say the first section is is very very readable and the second section is really really good too. It's a little different. It's quite different. Um but it's still fantastic. So it was published in 2016, and I'm not going to give you a lot of biographical details or more. He's he's deeply involved. Well, I will say that he's from England. He's very much a product of British culture from a town called Northampton, which plays a very significant role in in Jerusalem. It's it's Northampton is quasi Jerusalem reborn in a certain sense, and that's where he lives. That's where he hails from, and where he grew up. He's ten years older than me, so he's. In, according to the Kathy age designation, he is a mid-old. I am a young old. He's a mid-old. He's just entering mid-old oldum in the 70s. You're a mid-old. And he's always been associated with sort of the, uh, the sort of the somewhat artsy leftist, um, in the beginning, kind of underground comic scene. But then he kind of worked his way up because of, and he's mainly a writer. I don't know exactly how much he draws, but he does draw some. I think he even drew this, but maybe he didn't color it. But he's mainly known as a comic book writer. So a writer, basically. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about his comic stuff, except to say that he's famous for all kinds of different ones. And he worked on famous Superman, Batman, whatever. And then he kind of became disaffected with the industry, which, you know, it, I'm on the outside of it all anyway, but I can sort of see how that could happen, <laughs> especially if you are a kind of, a sort of a, a creative in that kind of anarchic or just focused on the craft or focused on your ideas type way, and not so much about the commodification of everything. I could see that that could be frustrating. I mean, you know, you we hear about it with musicians too, who get, who get sort of ha having to conform to certain things. But that's, uh, I'll leave all the comics off aside because I'm just not a comic person. I'm just not, and I'm very neutral about comics. I mean, I don't want to, I don't have time to read everything and I've kind of decided to not be a comic per person just because they don't appeal to me that much. The whole franchise stuff, I just can't get into it. Sorry, it's just not my thing. Um, he started writing, so this was published in 2016, so it's almost, it's like eight years ago, I guess, is that right? <laughs> And no, maybe not. Twenty-four. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, eight years. And he took it took him ten years to write, and you can really see why because it's so long and it's so kind of it's both very long, but it's all kind of intricately, intricately, intricately connected, and it has this kind of non like beyond two-dimensional aspect to it, which I kind of perhaps goes into the the graphic stuff or even not exactly movies, but it has a sort of he talks a lot about dimensions, specifically the idea that um, there are more than three. That's one of the main things. And so it's also a kind of a deliberation in a certain sense on uh, time and how the, how the way we perceive time is just one way that, that it is, can be perceived. And he brings in another way and he does it quite well. Uh, this idea that there's four dimensions and that, that apparently, and I don't know that much about this yet, this is another rabbit hole I can go down, he is what is called an eternalist. So someone who kind of sees the past, the present and the future as kind of um, having all, it, it all already has happened in a certain sense. So the, all three of them exist in terms of um, what it means to exist, whatever that means. And I guess if you're not one of those, I forget the t terms they used for, something to do with blocks. 
So if you only think that the past and the present exist, then you're a certain type of block person. And then some people only think the present exists, which I don't even know how that's supposed to work. Because if only the present exists, uh, it, it, it can get kind of head, heady pretty quickly. <laughs> and, and so anyway, that's one aspect. And then I think I mentioned earlier the, this whole term psychogeography. So th that is one thing that I really love. The fact that instead of like going expansive in terms of the world, he's going expansive in terms of focusing on a place and kind of making it multi-dimensional sort of that kind of infinity going in deep as opposed to going wide and he's done that with Northampton Northampton and specifically this this working class neighborhood called the boroughs which is this little neighborhood in the center of Northampton apparently and that's where basically where the whole story takes place except in different dimensions of it uh, to, to a certain degree and occasionally there's little sort of outings to other places and so connecting your big expensive novel to very specifically to it being about a place and in, in in a way that's part of the plot the plot is has to do with the the fact that Northampton plays a special role in in English history to do with a monk who brought back a cross from one of the crusades and was told by an angel to build they, they, would, they had to build a church where he brought the cross back and there's a church, the Church of St. Gregory is in, in this area. That's just one of the aspects of the novel. And I found out that if you go to a, if you enhance this picture, this top one here is the actual cross, it's supposed to be a picture of the cross. So the whole, this is the whole sort of, the various chapters of the story as is, is, is in this fantastic image here of the different dimensions. You see how it's a house and then it's going up and down into different dimensions. <laughs> so there's that. And I saw, I was look, looking around how to explain it. And even the blurb on the back, which I think he may have written himself, I'm not sure, it's quite well written, so it sort of fits. Sometimes blurbs are not so great, but I wrote here, or I got it from the internet, a supernatural historical fiction. So it's, on the one hand, there's a lot of history in here and a lot of sort of famous people like Charlie Chaplin pops up and other famous people. And later on, I think of the third volume, it's gonna be Lucia, um, Joyce, the daughter of jo James Joyce, who spent some time in an asylum in Northampton, or a lot of time, most of her life, I think. And so, but it's supernatural because it's, it's, a, and he's obsessed, even beyond this book, with the liminal, the, the veil between the, the before and after lives that we live. So death and birth, these, these kind of, you know, big events in our lives for, for obvious reasons seem to be something that he thinks about a lot and the transition from one to the other both of them uh, are seem to be intriguing to him he has sort of come out as someone who does practice magic he's an occultist he's interested in this this kind of and he even has albums there's a, an album of music that he's made with other sort of occultist friends so this is sort of a later part of his identity is that he's become interested in spirits and spirituality and and all that stuff and the parapsycho parapsychology of, of a certain sort and there are a lot of ghosts in here too you know it's about ghosts and i'm all fine with that um no it's fine i think it's very interesting so i'm just looking at my notes here and they're going to be off the cuff but i wanted to give you a deeper sense of why it's so enjoyable so i the first thing i wrote here was a truly joyful reading and listening experience and part of the joy is that it is simon vance he's such a good narrator of these long tomes and i had just been listening to nicholas nickleby which i also deeply loved and by simon vance and so now i can't help thinking oh this is kind of like a modern day wacky supernatural dickens story because of the wide the uh, scope of characters not place necessarily but there's a lot of different characters that come up he's not really dickens he writes differently he's more modern um but not completely unlike dickens there's uh, there's a lot of humor in there and and a sort of a endearing he has a kind of endearing you can tell he likes his characters and he sort of portrays him with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek but he's sort of on their side Another thing that appeals specifically to me, I think I've already mentioned that I do like it when the focus, when, when working class folks or somehow marginalized people 
uh, foregrounded and this is very much about that. It's very much all about the, the working class, the sort of left behinds of this area, the boroughs, which was basically a not e perhaps not even working class at the end. They're the, the center of this whole novel that then sort of scopes out into the whole world and, and he's raising them up by, by putting them in this, this brilliant work of fiction. And so that's another thing that appeals specifically to me, as opposed to reading about very hoity-toity people, which is fine if it's well done. I mean, I love Henry James too. And Edith Wharton sometimes, I do love her stuff too, but it's very much like about all these rich people. And it's like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I just, it, it's not, I, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't read it. I, I think she's great too, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I just think it's great when it, when when we get the other side of things and it's sort of focused on it in a sort of creative way. It's not sort of realist. It's 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 supernatural and 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 that's cool too. A what so going back into my notes, a wide cast of characters for whom I almost immediately felt sympathy towards and interest in. So he has this way of just writing so well that you're you're caught up in the narrative straight away and you're caught up in, in what the characters are telling you and their point of view. I thought they were all and they're all quite different in the first book. It switches quite quickly and so you have to kind of go with that. But each time I was like, okay, this is a new person and then he's interesting too, or she's interesting. Goes back and forth between old and also different peri periods of time. So it's like it is a bit of whiplash going on here, but it's fine. It works really well. I think that's one reason why the second part is different because there you're mainly in one area with one group of people. And so you have to kind of get used to that. There's a waiting a little bit for it to change. And it's changed to the different group of people in the group, but it hasn't changed to elsewhere because it's all taking place in this upper upstairs person because it's, it's basically honing in on one of the characters sort of sojourn in, in the afterlife who's then going to go back to the living. But that's the second part of the book. The first part is this wide cast of characters that he talks about. Moore makes all of them and their fates seem intriguing. He interweaves their lives in intriguing and time-crossing ways that make you more invested in the story. So the characters pop up in each other's stories, uh, and I keep saying intriguing. I take a drink every time I say intriguing. Uh, so one character sees a vision of two people in a room, and then consequently we see those two actually in the room. And this makes you sort of the whole sort of connectedness of the plot becomes revealed to you in this kind of casual way. An online reviewer named John Andrew Koch, K-E-O-G-H, states, quote, the plot is meandering, almost vestigial in some sections. And to that, I would say, my comment on that sentence is, I would say the plot is created by seeing the fates of these characters. It becomes more important to us because of the various destinies that are laid before us and in, that we are introduced to. And we become invested in how they are connected. K-E-O-G-H, so Ko, P-O, also compares the novel to the Bayou Tapestry, uh, which is interesting because yes, the way it strings events along is perhaps tapestry-like, you kind of see it which would kind of go back to comics in a certain sense, the visual, but its emphasis on the existence of different dimensions, to my mind, makes it more akin to diorama or three or four dimensional tapestry or scene uh, that you see kind of, not exactly a movie, no, that's, that's too, still too flat. I want it to be three dimensional, at least, <laughs> than, than either, either of those. The main thing I love is just how it pulls you in and then takes you along for the ride. And Simon Vance, the narrator, is really good at helping with this, and it's just kind of lovely. The one time when he's, when it sort of it took me a while to get used to his speaking, was when he's, one of the characters is from America, and so he has to do an American accent, and it takes a little bit of, he's not that good with the accent, but it's still fine. Here's another sentence from the review uh, that I'll post a link to from Kyo Ko's review that I wholeheartedly agree with, and I think it's really nice. He writes here, quote, it's holy and profane, poetic and pedestrian, beautiful and gritty. It's deeply human. It's hard to explain. You really need to read it. And the deeply human part is there too. You really get the sense of a more as a very warm person. Like he, I don't know, I just get the sense that he's he's a good person. Uh, and, and, this, and there's also, there's quite a bit of adult themes in there, but even that's sort of addressed in a sort of warm way and not sort of, it's not misogynistic, um, 
and it's always from the character's point of view, but there's there's a sort of there's a wholesomeness to it almost I would say even though it's sort of addressing somewhat dark themes sometimes but I I think I mean even though it has everything in there all of life is in there life and death and in between it's still sort of that as I have said I also concur with Kelly's praise for more as a writer yes it is indulgent but I would concur never overly so and I don't think there's too many it's not overly wordy it is poetic it is lyrical. Um, I should have prepared a quote for you guys. Actually, I was just reading one that might work. It's in this one of the chapters here. It's kind of where I'm at right now. One of the the characters is contemplating everything, her, her, her existence and her fate. She's one of the ghosts in this group of ghosts. And she is young. But one of the things he does is that when you're a ghost or in this in-between, you kind of can decide at what age you you walk around this realm and you can become young, be younger than you were or older uh, to a certain extent. And I think she's decided to be somewhat younger. This is about trees. She's thinking about trees and I like trees too. And she says, she's just sort of, it's we're in her head. Were trees in any way aware, she wondered, of the animal and human flow that rushed so frantically about them in their still longevity? Marjorie thought the trees must have some knowledge of mammal activity if only in the broad historic sense, forested Neolithic valleys raised to black stumps by the first land clearances and acres of felled timber to erect the early settlements. Wars would leave their reminders, spears and shrapnel sunk into the bark, while hangings, plagues and decimations yielded welcome human compost, nutrients to spark fresh growth. Extinctions brought about through overhunting, whether by men or other predators, would change and modify the woodland world in which these timeless giants existed, sometimes in a minor way, sometimes disastrously. The mounting centuries would be accompanied by urban overspill, planning permission, yellow bulldozers and diggers. All of these would have their impact, would send tremors through the hushed continuum of an arboreal consciousness, a vegetable awareness rising and descending with the sap. I think it's wonderful. I think he's a good writer. Uh, let's see. So there's lots of passages in that vein, sort of. Uh, I especially loved how the overall structure of the whole thing is revealed slowly and carefully. It's sort of becoming more and more apparent, like a like a puzzle um, pieces kind of putting, well, it's the opposite. It's sort of like the unveiling as opposed to putting it together. I, I mean, either analogy would work, whatever you want to, however you want to see it. Um, the opening pages where the read, which was actually the prologue, and I often have a hard time with prologues because I kind of just want to get things started, but this prologue where we're in the point of view of one of the main characters, I thought was really interesting. One of the, it was uh, the female character who's basically supposed to be a stand in for more himself a little bit. And she's young, but she's obviously sort of precocious. And uh, she has an, uh, it's the first glimpse of, so in the story, just the whole structure of the story, the angels play a role, but they're always called the builders and sometimes angles. So another thing I love is how archit architectural the whole thing is. It's all about the scaffolding and uh, the builders who are building, and they're, but they're also the angels. And for reasons that I won't go into, they're playing billiards, or, or I think they call them something else, trilliards or something. Uh, the, the sort of celestial game of pool that they're playing. Uh, let's see. She's no ordinary girl, beautifully poetic and somewhat detached manner. The first section includes shifts in time that you might think would be exhausting, but more quickly pulls you into each new setting and because of his adept as a, as a writer. It's linguistically inventive too. So when these angels speak, uh, they do so in a weird slow motion manner and they also twist words around and also what happens is when you enter the afterlife this in-between man soul place on the way to something higher you kind of the words come out in a different way too and it has to do with the fact that you're in a different time configuration time space is different up in this area because it's for it's fourth dimensional and in Mansoul, the second part, which is the one that hones in on this group of young people and their exploits in this area called Mansoul, and then in the sort of, as they go down as ghosts into the the normal world, um, he does, he, he spends quite a bit of time trying to describe the how things seem. And like the, when they go into the normal world, they see things in black and white, or when ghosts 
move, they, there's always a lot of after images when they move because they're moving in a different dimension and all things like that. And all that's kind of fun too. And he introduces you to it in a way that's pretty clear. I mean, I don't think it's hard to follow. So that's why I'm a, a little bit surprised, but then again, perhaps not that people say how it's a difficult book. It's, it's I think, that compared to something like Malazan, Straight Up Fantasy, which was mind-bogglingly complex and and you sort of plopped right into this very complex world building. This is not difficult. This is somewhat fantastical and somewhat interesting and somewhat perhaps philosophical, but because you're in the perspectives of these different characters and they're all pretty down to earth and having these experiences, it's not that difficult. It's just long is what I would say. And so those are my initial thoughts and I will try and at least in my more hopefully more regular wrap-ups I'll talk again about when I actually finish the book this was I know I haven't finished the whole thing but I don't think I'll I'll come back and talk about specifically the, the last section I still have about 28 hours to go of a 60 hour book <laughs> so yeah and sometimes I take breaks because it is a lot you know I just don't want to always listen to it but it's been pretty regular so far and we'll see how it goes I hope to finish it pretty soon we're, we're entering into the time the school starts and yeah, I hope to get other videos out uh, soon. And thank you all for watching. Hope you, this was sort of interesting to people and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.